Hello, this is Jeremy Zimmerman at Colorado School of Mines, and today's video is going to discuss the reciprocal lattice and, in general, reciprocal space. Earlier in the class, we talked about lattice planes, and we defined them using a vector normal to the surface of each of those planes. So when we described this vector, we had to use a special um, basis for describing that, and that basis was in reciprocal space. We used the reciprocal lattice. So we also went through some definitions of the reciprocal lattice. Um, the first one being this matrix here. So if you take a dot a star here, and you, you will always get one, a dot b star is zero, and a dot c star is zero. So what this tells you is that a and a star um, have some angle between them. It's usually a smaller angle. Um, but A and B star are perpendicular to each other, and A and C star are perpendicular to each other. You go through the rest of this matrix, and you will see the same sorts of things about um, B and C star, for example. Now, one word of caution. Solid state physicists do not define this quite the same way. They make one minor adjustment. And instead of having ones down the diagonal, they have a 2 pi down the diagonal. And this changes the way the math looks a little bit, but it doesn't change anything fundamentally. The second way we defined uh, vectors in reciprocal space was, you know, kind of comes out of this matrix you have above. So if you take the cross product of B and C, you get a vector that is perpendicular to both of those directions. And then we divide by the volume and we get the reciprocal lattice A star. Um, and similarly for B star is C cross A divided by B, and C star is A cross B over the volume. Finally, we were able to go between a metric tensor and a reciprocal metric tensor by taking the inverse of, of each one. And you can do this iteratively and go back and forth. So these concepts seem a little bit abstract. They're very much, there's a lot of math involved here. But the idea of reciprocal space is not an abstract concept. Um, it is very important to understand in order to do many calculations we need to do and to uh, explain certain observables. So the first one is anytime you scatter a wave off of a crystal, you get a diffraction pattern. This diffraction pattern is actually a slice of reciprocal space. Many of the electronic properties, such as the band structure, are governed by how the electrons in the material um, move through this lattice, and they're, so they're going to scatter off this lattice, and we always have to use reciprocal space to describe this. And finally, um, electrons aren't the only type of wave you can send through your lattice. You can also think about heat moving through your lattice. So this is how vibrate, vibrations of the atoms in your lattice um, move through it. And these vibrations are called phonons. And again, we, we use reciprocal space to describe and understand what's going on in this space. I want to build a more physical picture for reciprocal lattices and reciprocal space. I'm going to take a one-dimensional lattice, as shown at left by the blue dots, and I'm going to send a wave into that lattice. If the wave and the lattice can interact, we might expect the wave to scatter. For the particular wave that we've shown interacting with this lattice at left, one thing that we notice is that every single lattice point is seeing the same phase of the wave at the same time. If this were to happen, you might expect something interesting to happen, like interference of your scattered waves. Now, the wavelength I showed before was not the only wavelength that could end up with a equal phase at every lattice point. Here I've shown a wavelength of one half of the translation vector. We could also use a wavelength of one third of the translation vector. Now, I started with just a cosine wave, but we can also apply a phase offset. So here I offset the wave by a quarter of a phase, 
and we see that still every single lattice point sees the same phase of the wave. For this set of, of waves where every lattice point sees the same phase, we can, instead of using the wavelength, we're going to use the wave number. So this is k, which is equal to 1 over the wavelength. And these k values for the set of all waves that have so that the lattice points experience the same phase is going to define our reciprocal lattice. So for a lattice translation vector of one nanometer, the k values or the wave number values that are allowed are going to be integer values divided by the translation vector of the lattice. So we could have a k of zero inverse nanometers, plus or minus one inverse nanometers, plus or minus two inverse nanometers, etc. So we can guess that if each of these lattice points is seeing the same phase of the wave and they're each scattering some part of the wave, this is the sort of situation where you might get constructive interference of the waves. And this can be really important. Now, there are cases, there are many waves where the lattice points will not all see the same phase of the wave. And here's one particular one. And I have set k equal to 1.5, which is not um, one of the integer values of, of, of k divided by t. So we do not see any, expect anything interesting to happen here. And here's just another example with k set at 2.4. Again, all of the lattice points see different phases of the wave. So this is really interesting. We have set up a lattice in direct space, and we've set up a set of k values in reciprocal space. And both of these sets of, of numbers are equally spaced, so they both form lattices. If we had instead worked with wavelengths instead of wave numbers, the space that we work in would be really hard to deal with. So where we, we can think of this k equals zero case, ends up being an infinitely long wavelength. Um, the other wavelengths that are non-trivial solutions would be you know, lambda, one half lambda, one third lambda, et cetera. And again, these are not evenly spaced and it gets really hard to work with. So it's much more convenient to work with equally spaced numbers in reciprocal space. And so that's why we work with k. I want to extend the ideas that we developed on the last slide into uh, two-dimensional punishing mechanisms. All we have to do is move up in a dimension in space. So the way we're going to do that is we're going to replace our one-dimensional wave number, which was k in the last slide, and we're going to replace it with a k in the x direction and a k in the y direction. Now you may see these combined into a general case that has a vector form and a position in space r. So if we look at the wave at left, what we've done is we've set kx equal to 1 and ky equal to 1, and we see that all the blue dots, which are the lattice points, see the same phase of this wave. If I were to set kx equal to 2 and ky equal to 1, we would see that every lattice point still sees the same uh, phase of the wave there are going to be a large number of kx and ky values where every lattice point will experience the same phase. This will be, for, for this particular case where we set the lattice points to be spaced at integer spacings, the values for kx and ky are also going to be integer spacings. Um, so this set of kx and ky values is going to be the reciprocal net or the reciprocal lattice. Here I've collapsed the picture down into a kind of a two-dimensional plot so we can see what's going on as we let this wave move through space. So again, we've set kx equal to 2 and ky equal to 1, and we see that every um, lattice point, which is now in red, sees the same phase of this wave. We let this move an eighth of a cycle through the crystal. We see that still every single lattice point sees the same phase. If we move a little further, further, again everything sees the same phase. So this is a member of the reciprocal lattice. Now we could have picked a non-integer value for kx or ky, 
what we see is that the lattice points see different phases of the wave. So this is not a member of the reciprocal lattice. We can extend this idea very easily into three dimensions, and all we have to do is add a kz times position in z into our cosine function at the top. There is another way to think about reciprocal lattices, and this is through the Fourier series and Fourier transforms. If you take a periodic function of any shape, you can build that shape up with a series of periodic functions. We typically use sines, cosines, or complex exponentials. If we use kind of evenly spaced values, we can build this in a series, and we call that a Fourier series. If we had a real crystal and it had some electron density in it, we could describe that electron density by taking the Fourier transform of the real crystal, and that'll give us all of the different wave vector values that build up that electron density. Um, so I assume that at first that we're talking about just a series, but we can make a generalization. And instead of doing a series, we want to do an integral. So it works in all cases. And this is called a Fourier transform. I'm going to build up these delta functions at x equals 1, 2, 3, and 4 by adding together different cosine waves. On the left, I am showing um, how we're going to add up um, to get these delta functions at x equals 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4 by using just cosine waves. What my Mathematica um, program does is it's going to show us um, a couple different waves and then we're going to add them all up and we'll see what the resulting wave looks like. So we start at the top with our lattice points, and then we're going to um, show both the, the wave of k equals 1, and then um, k equals 2 at first, and then k equals 3, 4, and on and on. And so um, then we're going to add up all of the, the waves from k equals 1 through k equals n. So we can approximate this set of lattice points with just a cosine, and what we, which is what's shown at the and we can see that, yeah, this is you know, starting to look like something, but it's really a bad approximation. What we're going to do is we're going to add in a second wave of k equals 2. And we can see that when we set k equals to 2, we still see maximum at all of the lattice points in both wave functions. But we see different values for the wave everywhere else. And so this means you get constructive interference at the peak of the wave, at the lattice positions, and you get destructive interference everywhere else. And so we can see at the bottom that we're, we're doing a little bit better. Our function gets a little bit sharper around each of the lattice points, but you still have a lot of noise. So we can add another wave in. So here's k equals 1, k equals 2, and k equals 3. And we can see that our, our function right around the lattice points, which is going to be right kind of in these regions, is getting sharper. But we still have a lot of kind of wiggles in between. Now, if I increase this up to the first nine, we see that we're getting pretty close to getting these delta functions. And you can continue adding this on up to infinity. And at that point, you would get delta functions. The math for a Fourier transform looks like what I've shown here. We take a function in real space, and we're going to multiply it by um, some type of a wave. We're, in this class, we're just going to use complex exponentials. And so we, here is our complex exponential here. And then we're going to integrate this across the whole space. And when you do this, what you're going to get out is you're going to get a function in wave vector space, so a function of k. Something to know is you could take the Fourier transform of a Fourier transform, and it returns the original function. One of the cool things is that we can do this process physically. And the way we physically do this is a diffraction experiment. So if we take a lattice and we send in a wave and we look at how that wave scatters off all of these different um, lattice points in all of space, we're essentially integrating across all space. And so what we have is a real space function for the crystal and you have a wave that you send in and then you integrate it across all of space. So you're actually taking the Fourier transform of the crystal. Um, so for a finite sized crystal, the delta functions um, that you should have gotten for each k value um, broaden into sync-like functions, very much like we see at the lower left of this screen. In summary, there exists a set of waves for which every direct lattice point 
will simultaneously experience the same phase of the wave. This set of wave vectors, k values, right, that defines these waves is the reciprocal lattice. This set of wave vector or k values will be integer multiples of 1 over lambda, where lambda equals the translation vector of the lattice. The reciprocal lattice is also the Fourier transform or Fourier series of the direct lattice and vice versa. Um, if either lattice is finite in size, you have to use the Fourier transform. And finally, the reciprocal lattice exists in this kind of general reciprocal space, and the units of the wave vectors are always in inverse length. We usually work in nanometers in a crystal, so the, the units on our k values will be inverse nanometers. So I have some things I'd like you to think about. First, think about which definition of reciprocal space makes the most sense to you. So we covered three. There's kind of these matrix definitions, or the wave and phase descriptions, or Fourier transform. Second, I want you to download the Mathematica notebook that I used to generate all of these graphs. Um, you can play with the animations and pay attention to when lattice points see particular phases, and also read the words. I put descriptions of what each manipulate function and graphic is supposed to be teaching you. This is a hard topic, and one of the good ways to make sure you understand a topic is to try to explain it to someone else. So I want you to try to explain um, what is reciprocal space to a friend. Um, it might also be good to write out a definition in your own words for reciprocal space. So this is a hard topic, and it takes a while to grasp. So I suggest that you watch this video again tomorrow or a couple days later um, just to give it a couple chances to sink. That's it. I'll see you in class.